Almighty is in our midst. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is among them. We come before the awesome, holy presence of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us humble, let us humble ourselves before him. Let us gratefully sing our praises for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. Dear God, we gratefully receive your pardon and trust in the cleansing power of your spirit in us. Help us to grow in the kind of worship that pleases you. Draw us closer from your heart and transform us more and more into the likeness of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his mighty name we pray.
Almost everything that exists has a beginning. And people celebrate, or at least are curious, as to their beginnings. And in fact, carry those beginnings as part of their identity. One of those important beginnings is one's birth date. And proof of its importance being that it is almost always needed as part of one's identity in conjunction with one's name. There are other beginnings that we tend to mark such as the beginning of a new year, the beginning of a new chapter in life, such as marriage or moving into a new house. People and events naturally have beginnings. I said almost everything because there is only one who has no beginning 
and that is the one eternal God who has no beginning nor end because he is supernatural. As Christians, the Bible teaches that we belong to the church, that membership is a vital part of our identity as Christians. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. There is a whole branch of theological study about the Christian church that is ecclesiology, but for our purpose today, we shall begin with a core foundation as we observe Church Membership Month. And so the overarching question is that of the beginning of our church. As we go through the basics about church and answer six important questions of who, why, what, when, where, and how, we shall see that the central focus and foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. And so in answering these six questions, we will see that Christ is at the center of all of these. Let us begin with a question, who is the church? As we know from the account of Matthew, the gospel writer, on one occasion, Jesus asked his disciples what they have come to know about who he is after they had been with him for about three years. By the time people had come to hear about, they had come to meet, they had come to be healed, to be fed, or to be taught by Jesus. Some thought or believed that he might have been a resurrection or an appearance of the prophets of old like Elijah or Jeremiah because of his miraculous works. And some even thought that he might have been the resurrection of John the Baptist, who had just recently been beheaded. But Jesus wanted to know if his disciples have recognized him to be who he really was. Who do you say I am? It was Peter who replied, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This was the answer that Jesus was waiting for. And Peter got it right. And Jesus declared, Peter blessed by that correct answer. However, he made it clear that he got it right not because he was more knowledgeable or wiser than the others or because he, he learned it through his own human abilities or even because he simply made a good guess. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this, referring to that declaration, was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, meaning by human persons, but by my Father in heaven. Peter correctly stated the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, meaning the anointed one to save Israel and the world as prophesied in Old Testament scriptures. And he correctly stated the identity of Jesus Christ being the son of the living God. Meaning that he is pre-existent with God. In other words, he was there with God from eternity. From the beginning. If there is such a thing as beginning in eternity. But before everything else began, he was with God. Because it was revealed to him directly by God. It is an eternal truth imparted by God to the human 
Peter. It is not of human origin or persuasion or reasoning, not even from Peter's own mind. It was made known to him by God the Father. And so Jesus said, you are Peter. In a way, emphasizing to him that his name means rock. But now that name has come to a new meaning and significance because Jesus said, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Just as Peter, a name which means rock, had recognized and declared correctly Jesus' identity as Messiah and Son of God. That same declaration what is that declaration? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That same statement will be the rock, meaning the solid foundation, the solid basis on which Jesus will establish, set up, raise up, and fortify his church. So that rock is the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The truth is powerful because the truth establishes what is honored by God. And so, this helps us answer the question, who is the church then? As Peter recognized Jesus Christ for who he truly is, so all who come to recognize Jesus as Messiah, the Son of the living God, make up the church. As the Apostle Peter himself later wrote, and we read this from his letter in the New Testament about who the church is, I quote, As you come to him, the living stone. Now that stone is spelled with a capital S. Meaning to say he stands alone. He is in fact the cornerstone. The solid rock on which the church is founded. And uh, Peter continues, Rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, referring to the church, like living stones, this time this is spelled with a small s, you are being built into a spiritual house. Now he teaches that Jesus Christ is the living stone for the Old Testament prophesied about a chosen and precious cornerstone who is none other than our Savior. So here we see um, the foreshadowing of what the church will be. In the Old Testament, the church as Jesus Christ prophesied it to be was not yet present in the Old Testament. It was still a mystery, a truth that would later on be revealed by God. And Peter continues in his letter, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Peter, in a sense, was the first little living stone or pebble. And after him, all who trust in Jesus Christ are now the billions upon billions of other living stones, small letter S, pebbles who form the church. And so who is the church or who make up the church? Membership to the church is on the basis of relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, that declaration is not merely a statement of the mouth. It is a belief of the heart. And so when you talk of the heart, you talk about a relationship. And because Jesus is the living stone, it is a relationship with him. Jesus declared Peter blessed because God revealed the truth to him. 
So it is with us and all true Christians. It is by God's revelation to our spirit, to a person's spirit, that he can believe this truth. No amount of information and teaching and head knowledge can make one come to this conclusion with conviction in the heart that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, unless God reveals this to him. For this truth is discerned on the spiritual level, person to person. So it is only when that truth is embraced by one spirit that one becomes reborn. Reborn of the spirit and having been reborn becomes a child of God. A spiritual child. You are given birth to a new person. Not physically but in the spirit. This is what John says is the miracle of of God that the Holy Spirit accomplishes in a person's life. The wind blows where it pleases. So it is with the one who is born of the Spirit, where the Spirit of God pleases to reveal Himself and that undeniable truth. Now the original word used for the church in the Old Testament, which was written originally in Greek, is ecclesia, from which we get the word iglesia in Spanish and even in Tagalog. Now ecclesia means those called out to form an assembly. It's like from a big population, certain persons are chosen and called out to form a united assembly and so it is God who calls persons out of the darkness of sin into the light of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ you and I were called out by God it is God who reveals the truth it is God who gives the faith to believe the truth and the person now taking that gift of faith is made part of the assembly of the church or the assembly of believers spiritually speaking and physically speaking one belongs to the true church on the basis of his true relationship with Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord and so when someone asks or some people ask what is the true church is it the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Roman Catholic, or is it any other group for that matter? The Bible does not mention any of those denominations or any denomination as we now know them to be, which one must be a member of in order to be saved or to be called the true church. If you have a living relationship of faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. You belong to the church. You have come to belong to the universal church. Now the universal church, physical and spiritual, because the universal church refers to the, the general, the overall, the total assembly of both the living Christians as well as those who have already died. The ones who live in various places of the world yet are identified with Jesus Christ because they have a living relationship of faith and love. All of those people from various parts of the world are part of the universal church. We are a part of the universal church. The question perhaps is, what does the true church believe in and teach? Of course, today we know that the very foundational teaching is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And there are many others that flow from that faith declaration. 
that's a whole lifetime of knowing and that is for another message in the coming days suffice it to say for now that one becomes part of Christ church on the basis of one's relationship with him as God the Father has made it possible now this leads us to the next question, which is an important part of being church. If we are the one body of Christ, why are there many churches? <clears throat> now it is easier to understand this when we think of global organizations. Let us compare or more or less um, explain it through the um, other global organizations like the Red Cross or the Rotary Club or perhaps the global company where you are employed. You say you are a member of these organizations, but your membership is through the local chapter or branch where you actually serve either as a volunteer or you are part of the workforce. So if you say, I am a member of the BPI Bank that is, I believe it has global, it has, uh, it, is a, it has global branches and yet you belong to a certain branch. Therefore, why do we need to be part of a local church? Because Christians participate in the life of the one body of Christ when they are part of a local church. The Bible says, just as the body is one but made up of many parts with their respective and varying functions, so it is with the church. Each part has a role to play, a responsibility to do. Each part has an opportunity to love and be loved. And so that can happen only when you truly belong to something that is tangible. And this now leads us to the, to the answer of the next question. What is the purpose of the church? Ephesians 4 verse 12 says, Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is a long mission statement. In other words, the church is built to grow unto Christ-likeness. The church is the body of believers and we are being built by our Lord to grow spiritually, to become more and more like our Lord, Jesus Christ. To become more like Him in character and commitment to the salvation of the world. Character and commitment to the salvation of the world. We grow more and more like Christ when we have His mind of obedience to God the Father when we have his heart of compassion for others, when we set our minds more on the eternal and not on the temporal. We grow more and more like him when we increase in our commitment to the gospel of salvation and to our share in evangelism and missions. All this growth takes place in our relationship with God and with other believers. Working together, living together in practical ways as what happens in a local church. The New Testament teaches a lot about how brothers and sisters in Christ ought to relate to one another in love. We will never know the level of our maturity until we have to relate to one another. This is expressed in deepening spiritual and practical relations or relationships with each other. Individual growth as a Christian cannot happen without commitment 
not just to an idea. It has to be a commitment to real people. Commitment to God is expressed in commitment to real people with whom we worship together. We study the Bible together. We pray together. We carry one another's burdens together. And we generally plan and work together toward a concrete goal. Another important thing is to know when the church was born. As I had already mentioned, it did not exist in the Old Testament, but in the New. Why do we say this? As we are told in Matthew, on one occasion when he was with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, that is located in northern Israel, so these are historical events with a place and time, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, the gates of death cannot overtake it. So Jesus spoke of a church that would be birthed sometime after that occasion. When he spoke that declaration, it was something in the foreseeable future. I will build. And therefore it was not yet built. I will build my church. True enough, after his resurrection, as he promised, the Holy Spirit was outpoured upon the disciples gathered in one place. Now filled with the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Peter preached the gospel and about 3,000 accepted his message and then they were baptized and they were added to their group, the original group of 120 original believers and disciples where Peter was one of them. From then on, these 3,120 or so believers began to, I quote, devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the church was born. We do not know the exact date nor time when this happened. We just know that it was sometime in the morning when Peter uh, preached that sermon. But we can infer from the account in Acts 2 that sometime 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, therefore it's known as the Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, dated sometime between AD 30 and AD 33, the church was born. That Holy Spirit infilling of the believers inaugurated the church. They were believers of Jesus Christ, whose lives were radically changed because they were changed from within. They were reborn in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit had begun to live in them. And they began to embrace a new purpose and direction in life. Acts 2.42 says, they devoted themselves to the they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. To devote means to de dedicate oneself. That is to lavish one's focus, time, energy, and purpose to someone or something. And so we speak of a devoted wife to her husband and children because her priorities are determined now by their needs and aspirations. Her priorities when she was yet single are set aside in favor of her family. I remember my mother telling me that after she got married, she immediately became pregnant and, and so the first baby was born nine months later. And she said, that was during that time after that, that was the first time that you would see me wearing step in, going out because she was always well, you know, well dressed and you know, her, her shoes were always of the, the expensive kind. But this time around, 
Her penchant for shoes had to give way to sandals and slippers because her priorities were, her priority now was her husband and her children. And so the believers have changed their priority. They have become one and devoted to the cause of Christ. Not that they have left their family and friends, no, but Christ has now occupied the topmost priority. Most likely they have done away with some of their activities to give way to learning. Time for learning from the apostles. For praying. They spent more time now with the new group they identified with. They were they had fellow believers. At first, they were strangers to one another. How do you suppose three thousand could be coming from the same group? No, they were strangers, all gathered there from several places. But this time around, they devoted some time to fellowship with one another, made extra effort to nurture a deeper relationship, not only with God, but also with one another, because they now have a common Lord and faith and baptism. As Ephesians 4, 2 to 5 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which in scriptures may mean either in sharing the ordinary meals or in observing the Lord's Supper. But in the context of Acts chapter 2, it would most likely mean the Lord's Supper was being spoken of here as Jesus had commanded his apostles to observe. Because in the narrative it said it is connected with prayer the breaking of the bread and prayer now the breaking of the bread as eating ordinary meals must have been implied in the fellowship in the activity of their fellowshipping with one another since at the start the church met in individual members homes so when was the church born the church was born when the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached on the day of Pentecost. And of course, the believers received that message by faith. Finally, how and where will Jesus Christ continue to build his church? Now, he told his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The triumph God, the omnipotent Father, Jesus the miracle worker, the Holy Spirit empowerer could have built the church by one stroke of the hand or by one single word of declaration. But in the trying God's authority, sovereign will, they commanded the church to grow by discipleship, which is what we now call the Great Commission. And so how and where the church will permeate all nations by making disciples of Jesus Christ. That is how the church will continue to be built. The legwork is given to us by Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no shortcut to it. The legwork together with the covering of prayer work. The church will grow in quantity and quality of Christians as we obey Jesus' great commission. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all members of the one body of Christ. The church which he established, which he owns, and which 
he will accompany and be with through all the pains and struggles, the pleasures and successes in our journey together until the end of the world. That is how important the church is to God's salvation plan. Ephesians 3.10 says, Now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The eternal purpose of salvation in Christ. What an awesome truth that is about who we are. Let us continue to embrace the truth and live it out as we build one another up in the church where God has placed us. Let us pray. Our Father in Heaven, our Head, Jesus Christ, the Head of the Church, we praise you, O oh God. Thank you for letting us know and reminding us not only of who we are, but of how great, how awesome, how loving, how powerful that identity is as Christians, members of the one body of Christ, the church. We cannot even begin to imagine, oh God, the immensity, the spiritual impact of that reality. It is an awesome identity and task, but we do not depend on ourselves. We know, O oh Lord God, that you hold us because you called us, you sustain us, you will be with us. Your church will stand. The gates of hell, death can never <clears throat> overcome us because we are the church of the ones who will be resurrected unto eternal life. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. Father, we ask, we humbly ask that you will continue to make your Holy Spirit power work in and through us, through your church, working all together as one body, recognizing each other's roles, each other's gifts, each other's responsibility depending on one another and yet carrying on our share of the responsibility because someone is depending on us. Thank you, O oh Lord God, that you have chosen us, you have called us out of darkness out of this world, into your glorious light. Father, we pray that we will continue to know this truth. Let it sink deep into our hearts. We will continue to love your church as we grow deeper in our love for you. For indeed, you have established this Lord Jesus with so much love, so much grace. Father, we pray for our very own local church that we will continue to hunger and thirst, Lord, for your presence, for your words, 
We will continue, O oh God, to be. We will, we will continue to grow in our passion for the greatest pursuit of life. And that is to mature spiritually so that we can be reflections of Christ and we can do the work of Christ through the Great Commission. Lord, thank you for giving us an opportunity to renew our minds. An opportunity, O oh God, to make a decision to apply ourselves more into what we are, to devote ourselves to your ministry and your mission. Individually and together as a church. Dearest Lord, we remember the other churches all around us just like us they have their share of challenges as well as successes father we pray that no matter how the future may be or whatever the circumstances we may find ourselves in oh god that we will continue to be anchored on the rock which is jesus christ he is the only one who can truly save us out of our sins unto eternal life and save us from our present troubles even now that we are Christians. We remember, O oh Lord, the churches in access restricted and even in persecuted, those who are persecuted in other lands. Father, we, we also presently remember the churches in Israel, especially at this critical time that they have they have declared war against those who have attacked them, the people of the land. We lift them all up to you, O oh God. Help us never to forget that you are the God who is in faithful covenant with your people, not only the Jews, but also those who trust in you, those Christians now in Israel who stand by you, O oh Lord God, and by their faith. Lord, we know that you have allowed this to happen for a grander purpose. Meanwhile, Father, we ask that you help us. You help them go strong and move on in faith despite the physical, emotional trauma and even death. Dearest Lord, we also pray for our very own satellite congregations and worshiping outreaches in Cosmopolitan Church. Father, we depend on you to be able to truly carry on the task with greater vigor as we face the future. Lord God, you said that we are to be uh, supporters and encouragers of one another. We pray, Lord, for our very own brothers and sisters in Christ here in our local church who are now undergoing difficulties, who are in pain because of sickness, physical as well as emotional. We also lift up prayers for those who may be in a season of doubt, in a season, Lord, of weakness in faith. We pray, O oh Lord God, that they will call upon the name of Jesus Christ, who is able to save. Father, thank you so much that you have given us all of these blessings, as well as the blessing of a land that we can call our own, a nation where we belong as well. We lift up to you, Lord, our beloved country. We lift up to you both the church and those who are still unbelievers among our leaders, as well as decision makers, as well as the labor force. Oh Lord God, in everything we pray that you will make us salt and light because that is who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Giving is an essential part of worship. As we now offer our gifts, 
Let us remember the words of Scripture. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> gifts for you through your church. We give them sacrificially by faith, for the harvest is plentiful and the needs are great. Multiply these resources, O God, and also the resources of the givers. For as your word says, you are able to bless us abundantly 
so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, we will abound in every good work. May your church be blessed to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sisters in Christ, let the love of God the Father, the grace of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit always dwell in your hearts and make you shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life that is in Christ, to the glory of God and all of God's people say, Amen. Thank you. 